All right, y'all turn to Joshua chapter 3. While y'all turn in there too, I forgot to say, um, I heard from Sandy and Ralph is going home Tuesday. So I appreciate everybody's prayers for him and please keep praying for him. Um, he's going home Tuesday and I think we're going to start class again next Tuesday, Lord willing. And also, uh, I heard from Art, Joanne got back news from the doctor and everything's good. She's got one little cyst they got to remove, but it's not cancer. So appreciate y'all's prayer for her and keep praying for them. All right, now we're going to continue with the ark now. What we're doing is we're dealing with this second part where the ark, after, after taking the condemnation of the law and covering it with the blood atonement, the ark's now leading them. And they're heading towards the promised victory. They're going to get that victory and they're not going to get it because they tried so hard. They're going to get it because God said so. But he's got to show them in the 40 years that they're only going to get it because God said so. Because they do everything in their power not to get it, don't they? Now we're going to show you the victory. Now the ark led them. And what was their journey like? Was it straight towards the promised land? Folks, they took the long way around the barn. Up and down them mountains. Up and down. And think why God take them out there. What's our life like after salvation? Up and down, up and down. We go up to a mountaintop of seeing the Lord, and then we go down into the valley of fire. And it's up and down, but He's teaching. Now let's go to the promised victory, and I want you all to see how it happens. There, there's so much here that I'm sure I'll miss a bunch of it or don't even understand a lot of it, but there are a few things here that I find fabulous. All right, Joshua gets them up to the Jordan River. Moses gets them right to the brink, and he dies, Right? Now, y'all think what that's a picture of. Who does Joshua a picture of? Christ. But Joshua is a picture of Christ in victory, isn't he? Moses was a picture of Christ in law. Now, was there any way Moses could bring them across that river? What would that typify? Victory through works. That typifies salvation by works or victory in works. It says Moses had to die. And as soon as Moses died, in other words, the law had to be put away. What about in each one of us individually? We've got to give up on the idea that we can perform to get these things. So Moses had to die. But then Joshua, a type of Christ, is going to lead him in. Now watch in uh, Joshua chapter 3. Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shadim and came to Jordan. I find that fascinating. Remember what the, the wood, the Shadim wood, they made the ark of and all the things of is a picture of humanity, isn't it? They are going to depart humanity at the Jordan. What's the crossing of the Jordan River a type of? It's a type of the separation, folks. It's death. It's, it's all these things. Now watch. They were moved from Shadim, came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and they lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days. Boy, how many times does God do this in the Scripture? After three days that the officers went through the host. They commanded the people saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests the Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. When you see the ark, it'd be like I could say when you hear the shout or you hear the trumpet or you see the Lord, right? And that's when we'll get it. Now verse 4. Yet there shall be a space between you and it about 2,000 cubits by measure. Isn't that amazing? Between the ark getting up and going through the Jordan and the people, how much space? 2,000 cubits. Does that remind anybody of the distance between the resurrection of Christ, the first fruits, and the, the harvest? Now he says, Come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way heretofore. Had anyone ever descended into death as Christ and come out victorious? There had been humans that had been resurrected, but all they were was resuscitated. Elijah raised the, uh, that little boy. Where's that little boy today? He's right back in the grave. Did Elijah have power over death? What we're going to see here in this particular thing is God has showed them in the wilderness that he had power over everything, and the last enemy that must be conquered is what? Death. And they're fixing to conquer the Jordan River. That's what's a type of. I told y'all the other night at class about um, if Jesus Christ be not risen from the dead, our faith is vain. Isn't it? If God can't get them across the Jordan, will they ever get the promised land? What good had 40 years wandering done? None. Folks, if God has power over sin, if God has power over the law and over the world and over the devil, if God doesn't have power over death, what good is it going to do us? 
None. If Jesus Christ could not uh, overcome death permanently, it would be like the man I told y'all the other night that fought Mike Tyson for 12 rounds and bragged about the 12 rounds. And Mike said, what happened in the 13th? In other words, in the 13th, Mike caught up to him too, didn't he? Well, that's kind of how death is. Death catches up to everybody. But when the apostles, it's a beautiful picture, the apostles before the cross had faith. Okay? They had hope. If I just put the cross up here. Oh. If I put the cross right here like this. Before the cross, the apostles had faith. A little old form of faith. They had hope. A little old form of hope. And they had love. Paul said these are the, the three primary gifts, right? But which one did he say was the greatest? Love. And why is love the greatest? It, it never fails. It endures. Now, <clears throat> people make dispensational things out of that and miss the point. Don't say, well, these are the... No, miss that. Love never fails. Alright? If you've got a wife or a husband and you love them and they pass away, do you quit loving them? If you've got your mother's past, your father, do you quit loving them if you really love them? Well, a lot of times we fall in lust and then we separate and you find out, well, that was never love anyway. But true love, does it ever fail? Did they say before the cross that Jesus Christ was the Son of Man? Did they say He was the Son of God? Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. But what did Peter know about a dead God? Nothing, folks. They couldn't understand that, could they? So when Jesus Christ died, what happened to their faith? It, fell. it was gone, folks. They had none. What happened to their hope? None. But did they still have love? Mary Magdalene, after the cross, it goes down to the tomb. She loves Jesus. She's willing to carry His body and bury it. But what does she think happened to His body? Somebody stole it. She didn't have faith. She didn't have hope. Why? Because our faith is founded on God's power to raise the dead. What they basically thought was like the two on the road to Emmaus. They're walking home having heard that Jesus is resurrected. They didn't believe it. They're walking home like this, aren't they? What happened to their faith and hope? It's gone. You know what they said? Jesus of Nazareth, with Nazareth which was a prophet. What had they decided? He's just another one of the dead prophets. He was the greatest of the prophets and did the most miracles, but in the end, even he couldn't overcome death. Now, it shouldn't surprise you. Israel killed all the prophets, didn't they? Mm -hmm. So they had nothing, folks, but just left that love they had for him. Now, what is the thing that makes all the difference for a believer? The moment that you realize God can physically raise the dead. Not some spiritual thing. Physically, does God have power over death? Mm -hmm. Is your physical body going to be raised? Yep. It's going to be raised and then changed, but it's going to be your body, right? The gates of hell can't prevail against Jesus Christ. Now, before the cross, Peter said, you're the son of God, right? But the night before the cross, a little girl said, aren't you one of his disciples? And what did Peter say? No. Started cursing and swearing, didn't he? After the cross, the priesthood, which had the power to kill you, told Peter and John, don't preach in this name anymore. And what did Peter say? Well, who am I going to obey? You or God? And he marched right, they beat him up, and he marched right down to the temple and prayed again. What made the change? He saw God could raise the dead. And what came with that? The Spirit of God. It, we must not believe only that Christ died for our sins. And if that's all you ever yeah. preach, you're missing the point. We've got to believe He was buried. Right. Sin was put out of the sight of God and He was dead. I mean dead. And what did God do the third day? Raised Him from the dead. Then can death have any dominion over you? There's the difference. So what happened after the cross? When they saw Jesus was raised from the dead, their faith became real, didn't it? Their hope became real. What is hope according to the Bible? Resurrection. What about their love? Their love multiplied, didn't it? Folks, this is what happens when we believe God has power over death. And that's the picture we're fixing to see here. God is going to take the Jordan River and stop it. And this is a picture of this right here. Now watch. The 2,000 cubits we've got. Now verse 5. 
Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Sanctify yourself? You want me to give you a parallel passage to this one? Hold your hand there and go to 2 Corinthians 7. Second Corinthians seven one. Having therefore these promises, didn't Israel have the promise of entering the land? Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. In other words, if I've got these promises from God and He's promised me these things and promised me He'd use me, what's my part? I need to believe it and let Him sanctify me, don't I? What would keep me from being sanctified, cleansed, perfected? Unbelief. Is this something that you can go do? No. Just as soon as you think you can go cleanse yourself, you're doomed to fail. Y'all know good. Look, I say, okay, I've done this, Lord, and I am never going to do it again. You have got to do it again because God's going to show you you cannot by your own power do these things. Now, back to Joshua. Verse 6. Joshua spake unto the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. By the way, the priests bear the Ark. On their shoulders, they bear the Ark. You know where the power is at? It ain't in the priests. The priests don't stop. The Jordan River didn't hold back for the priests. The priests' feet wasn't the... What is that picture to y'all? What are we supposed to be doing every day? Bearing Christ. We bear Christ, don't we? But do, do we have any uh, significance in the thing? No, we're just lifting up Christ in the eyes of people. That's the gospel. He says, verse 7, The Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, I'll be with thee. Thou shalt command the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, you shall stand still in Jordan. Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, Hereby you shall know that the living God, then is he doing something so they can know something? Folks, God could have just had it be low tide or a drought, but that ain't how he brought them across. He's bringing them across so they know that it's his power and it does it. Now watch what he promises them. Joshua said, Hereby shall you know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Parasites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. <clears throat> you know, there were ten nations over there, but God only picked seven for this verse. Why y'all reckon he picked seven? What's seven a number for? Completion. Perfection. Completion. You know what you can take from that verse? There was a complete number of things dwelling in what was already promised them. And did God have the power to drive them all out? What could you possibly have in your life that God couldn't overcome? What sin, what anything could you possibly have that God can't conquer? None, folks. He's got the power of all of it. And notice once more, those aren't invading forces. They're there by nature, aren't they? Who put them in that land to begin with? God. Now he says, verse 11. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. Did Christ go first? He did, didn't he? Now therefore take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every man a tribe, and it shall come to pass as soon as the souls of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan. The waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand up and heap. It's amazing. The water doesn't quit flowing. The water stands. Think about it. He didn't stop it forever, did he? He stopped its power. He stood it up. It's still there. He stood it up. It says, It came to pass when the people removed from their tents. Does that remind you all of anything? What's your tent right now? Your flesh. When the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, as they bear the Ark, were coming to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the Ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overflowed all his banks all the time of harvest. Here's another one. It's a picture of harvest, isn't it? It says that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city of Adam, that is beside Zaratan, 
And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed right over against Jericho. I want y'all to just think about the picture for a minute. Did God have the power? The ark's a picture of God's presence and power. Did God have the power to stop that which flowed from Adam? What came through Adam? Sin and death. Has God got the power over it? He does. He stopped the flow from Adam. You know what's amazing? The ark stopped the flow of Adam and it's going to rest on the stone of Abel. Think about that. It stopped that which came from man, the first man that sinned, and it rests on the first one in the scripture that we have that says faith, doesn't it? God's got the power to stop the, the flow. Now he says in verse uh, six, 17, the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. Did he lose a single one of them? Did any of them straggle behind? Did anybody say, tell you what, we're going to just stay here. We, we prefer, no, they all cross over, don't they? Okay? They cross over to Jordan. All right. The Red Sea crossing was salvation from bondage, and the Jordan River crossing is salvation into Canaan. One is liberty, where they're set free, and the other is final victory. Isn't it? Um, let's see. You and I are saved from the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of God. Is that what the Bible says? And yet, is the transition immediate? We've got that 40 years in between, don't we? See, we got the 40 years of wandering. I could call it... The difference from imputation to impartation. That distance in between, that's our 40 years. Isn't it? And here we go. Alright, the first generation had to die. You know, that the, everything, every one of them that crossed the Red Sea, all of it, 20 years old and over, the thing that crossed the Red Sea died in the wilderness, didn't it? But did the new life, a second generation pass over? You know, I could say it like Paul. I, the old man, am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I, the new man, live. This is the picture. This is what he's showing us through the scriptures. All right, the children had to learn the same thing. The one that brought them across the Red Sea is going to have to be the same one that's going to bring them across the Jordan, isn't it? If I did it this way, at the beginning of their journey is the Red Sea. We'll just do two bodies of water. Here's the Red Sea. Okay. Here's the Jordan. By the way, isn't it amazing how God laid out the geography? Jordan means descending, and what does it dump into? The Dead Sea, descending into death. Who, from, who brought them across the Red Sea? God. Who brings them across the Jordan River? God. You know what I could say? The same one that had to save them, set them free from sins, the one that's got to bring them through death, isn't it? I could just do it this way. God showed them that He, Christ, is the author and finisher. Isn't He? Yeah. Paul said, He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Christ. What's our part? Believe it. we got to believe it, folks. Jesus Christ said, If you had <coughs> faith as a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, Be removed, and it be removed. It, I, look, I don't know whether he... It doesn't matter whether it was physical or little. If God had a mountain that he wanted moved, could, they, could he give a man the ability to move it? Yes. But think about the spiritual meaning of that. Have there been men, one man that moved mountains? Martin Luther moved one, didn't he? Hey, did Martin Luther take on an entire kingdom? Mountains represent kingdoms in Scripture. Folks, Martin Luther had an entire kingdom chasing him, trying to kill him. Did he move that kingdom? You better believe he moved it. The Bible speaks in Revelation about earthquakes and kingdom shaking and all. This happens. I mean, go down through Scripture. Did Charles Spurgeon move a kingdom? Folks, he, England was descending into something awful. And Charles Spurgeon come along and God used him to stem something for many years, didn't he? And you could just keep going down through Scripture. Did Paul move a mountain? Mm -hmm. He took on the Roman Empire, didn't he? And what happened? He turned the world upside down. They themselves said so. This man's turning the world upside down. Okay. Now, let's uh, see. Alright, I got that, Canaan. Alright, they could have gone by the way of the coast. We already did that. The cubits we got, the ark. 
Y'all just give me a second. All right, let's go to Joshua 4. Now remember, this is the ark. It came to pass, when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every man a tribe. Now all these twelve rep are representations of the whole. It's a part for the whole, right? And you'd go to Revelation, you got 144,000, 12,000 from each. It's a representation. He says, verse 3, Command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared to the children of Israel out of every man a, tri a tribe of man. Joshua said unto him, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take you up every man a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, Where mean ye by these stones? Then you shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. So every time God gave a memorial, there was a purpose in it, wasn't it? What's the purpose? To teach when he gave them the Passover originally, remember what he said? When y'all have this Passover supper, your children will say, why are we doing this in our house? And what will you tell them? You tell them about when the Lord delivered you. What's the Lord's Supper? It's a memorial. For what? To glorify and talk about what Jesus Christ did. Folks, there ain't a better thing in the world to have somebody's child ask them, why do why we do this? Hey, today we, did, we ate bread. Well, why? What did you tell them about the Lord? This is a, it's a memorial. Now these stones, he says, uh, they, they do this. Verse 9 is the other side. Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priest, uh, which bear the Ark of the Covenant, stood there, there unto this day. Do you all see there's two sets of stones? They brought one set of stones out of the Jordan, which pictures death, and they brought another set from the land and put in it. Now, what do y'all? What verse does that bring to mind? That makes me think: put off the old man and put on the new, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. How about the the what the old covenant, twelve tribes, Israel law could never do, the new covenant can do, didn't it? It's a picture of doing away with the old and, and the bringing in of the new. Now, let's see, verse. Um, 11. It came to pass when all the people were clean passed over that the ark of the Lord passed over the priest in the presence of the people. Uh, let's skip down to verse uh, 18. It came to pass when the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come up out of the midst of Jordan and the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up unto the dry land that the waters of Jordan returned unto their place and flowed over all his banks as they did before. And the people came up out of Jordan on the tenth day of the first month. It's the same day Jesus Christ come riding into Jerusalem. It's the same day that they set aside the Passover lamb. Did God have a day set for this delivery? Was it going to happen one day before it or one day after it? Folks, God determined this is the day they were going to cross. And it says, Those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan, Joshua pitched in Gilgal. He spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye stones? You shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us when we were gone over that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you might fear the Lord your God forever. How true is this? When they come into Jericho in just a few chapters, right? They, there's a woman that's going to get rescued named Rahab, a Gentile, isn't it? Do you remember what Rahab said to those two spies earlier when she came in? She said, we heard about your God. What he did to the Egyptians at the Red Sea, that was 40 years earlier, wasn't it? We heard. And why did God do those signs and wonders? To teach and to magnify his name. Rahab believed based on what she heard. Israel was there and saw it and didn't believe. And what's that tell you? Faith comes by hearing, folks. You don't have faith in what you can see. That ain't faith. Faith comes by hearing. See, faith only comes when someone makes you a promise and then carries through with it. When someone just does something, that ain't faith. You just witness it, don't you? 
Therefore God said, let there be light, and then created light. God said, let the dry land appear, and it appeared. God speaks, and then He does it. Now what does that teach us? God does what He says He's going to do. So what does that give us? Faith. You all see how faith's a gift? Look, I had a granny that I had faith in. I had faith in my granny's word. But do you know that was my granny's gift unto me? It wasn't nothing I produced. I didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. How was it her gift to me? She what kept her word, gift? folks. She, she showed me in her life. She showed me. She proved it every day. How do I have anything to do with that? It would be ignorant for me not to have faith in her when she's proven herself, wouldn't it? You all think about a man making a great deal over his faith. That's silly. That's taken from the glory of God. You don't have faith based on anything that's in you. It's a gift of God. And what it's based on is I look here and I say, Hey, I've got a God that can't lie. Now, how am I not going to believe the one that can't lie? That's pretty simple, isn't it? It would be stupid to not believe it. Who in here would wager that the sun's not coming up tomorrow? Nobody? Y'all know what? There's coming a day when the sun ain't going to come up. It's possible, isn't it? But I would wager that it'll be coming up tomorrow based on what I've seen every day of my life. Right? What did God do in Israel between the Red Sea and the Jordan River? He showed them every day of their life. Did He sustain them in spite of themselves? Did He cover them with a the cloud in spite of themselves? You know, you know that sometimes at night I, I get on my knees to pray before bed at night and I think, you know, I didn't do anything worthy of anything to be accepted of the Lord today. Nothing. And He sustained me anyway. I've got a roof over my head and I did nothing to deserve it. I didn't miss any meals. I've got, I mean, I've got, He loves me and He loves me in spite of me. Ain't that what He showed Israel out there? And what did Israel do? Murmur. You know what me and you do? We murmur. Hey, oh, I wish I had a nicer house. Well, this is, uh, you know, ain't the one I find myself guilty of is this one. Open up the pantry and because there's not exactly what I want to eat. You know what I say? We ain't got nothing to eat. Yeah, Y'all ever do that? I mean, think about it. I know that's just a silly little example. But Sully said something last week in regard to the Lord's Supper. He said, you know something? We ought to eat every meal like this. I know what he meant. Eat every meal with what? With thank you for what the Lord did. If the Lord didn't die on the cross at Calvary and descend into death, experience death and separation from the Father and then be raised into glory, what would me and you have? Nothing, folks. There is nothing without that. He, Wayne said a few weeks ago, life ain't worth living without the Lord. That ought to be on a bumper sticker, shouldn't it? Hey, that, that's the truth. Now, they, they get this thing and they come in. But I want you all to see something wonderful in chapter 5. Let's just go straight into it. It came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over, that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. Did that miracle work two ways? It not only uh, is to build faith in one group, it convicts the other group, doesn't it? Could they deny that miracle? But do they believe? You talk about a, a, a testimony to election. They saw these things. Did they repent and come running to Israel? One bunch did. One bunch dressed up and pulled a, pulled a quick one and come running. Hey, they understood something. But watch now. At that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, Notice the very first thing they're going to do when they cross the Jordan. Make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. Now that doesn't mean they're going to circumcise each one of them a little more. Then Israel circumcised their children in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Then this new generation's got to be circumcised also, doesn't it? Now are there two circumcisions that we're going to experience? Mm -hmm. There's a circumcision of the heart spiritually, isn't there? When we believe, and then what's going to happen one day? Circumcision of the flesh. Flesh is going to be cut away and changed, isn't it? Now he says, Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. All the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war died in the wilderness by the way after they came out. All the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way as they came forth out of Egypt, then they had not circumcised. 
For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war, by the way, notice what they were. In other words, able-bodied, strong, right? Oh, I can do it. All that were mighty men of war which came out of Egypt were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. Unto whom the Lord sware that he would not show them the land which the Lord sware unto their fathers that he would give us a land that floweth with milk and honey. Then how is victory gained in the Lord? Standing on your feet with your chest stuck out? <clears throat> Laying down in the dirt before the Lord. You remember the Pharisee stood with his chest stuck out, mighty man of God, and prayed, didn't he? God didn't hear him. What did the publican do? He fell down in the dirt. Folks, in order to cross the Jordan, we got to come low, don't we? This is the, this is the idea. Now he says in verse 7, Their children whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because he had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in the places in the camp till they were whole. The Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off of you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. That means a rolling away. Now y'all think about the circumcision. Did God not deliver them from bondage back here? Right? But then they, in their mind, were in bondage all this time, weren't they? Look, God brought them out of Egypt and physically destroyed the Egyptian army. Physically, He dealt with them. There's no way they could get them. But what did Israel bring with them? They brought Egypt in their heart. Folks, they got over here, always pick with Lexi. They said, hey, we had onions and garlic. In Egypt, let's go back. Right? Think about what they were doing. Did they ever make a clean break from Egypt? When did they finally make a clean break from everything that there was in Egypt? When they broke here. And they're going to bring it back over here. But God's just going to keep showing us this picture again and again. But I want you to see something. We're delivered from the penalty of sin. Right here, aren't we? Salvation. Right? When will we be delivered from the presence of it? The presence will be delivered from it over here. The, the reproach of Egypt or sin will be rolled away physically, won't it? But in between, God has given us the ability... To overcome sin's power. And yet what happens? We live like this, don't we? But folks, this is by design. Don't you ever forget God did not march them along that lowland coast into the land. He brought them out into the wilderness. And me and you, tend to, uh, we tend to get down on ourselves. And look, we talk about sanctification and these things a lot. And we ought to. If I wouldn't teach, I wouldn't be worth my salt. But we don't ever need to stop and look back and realize something. This is by design. My failures are by design. That doesn't mean God makes me fail. It means God uses them to my own instruction. Did God lead them into the wilderness? He did. And what does that tell you about your own life? You're going to go through it too, folks. By the way, the wilderness, it's amazing. They left Sinai and they went into the wilderness of sin. That's what it says. Where do me and you live our life in? We're in this world, in the wilderness of sin. This is what we do. And it's like God has almost given us an inoculation against it mentally. You know, when you get an inoculation for the flu, what do they do? They give you some flu, don't they? Do you think any of us, after this period, look, you did not have, I don't care what you say, before you were saved, you did not have a real hatred of sin. Our human bodies like it. The Bible says we joy in it and we rejoice in those that do it. Y'all know good and well when we're when you're guilty of something, you love to see another guy guilty of it. Misery loves company. Y'all know we do. Yeah. You know, we say, oh, no, don't, Dad, just take a drink. Yeah, that's right. Come on, you know, with me. You know that kind of thing. But after you get saved, you still don't have that real hatred of it. But what do you slowly start to learn? God, you can't learn to hate it. Why? Because it has a worse effect every day. Look what God gives us. Folks, your body doesn't get better every day. It gets worse every day, doesn't it? So then God teaches us over here after we begin to learn to hate sin. By the time we get over here, I've been spiritually delivered. I'm going to be physically delivered. But you know what? I'm going to have a longing to be delivered for it like you can never imagine. Will any of us over here ever say, boy, I wish I could go back? Now think about the angels. 
Did the angels have the presence with God? But did they get this experience we've got? Mm -hmm. Therefore, what did some of them do? They, they chose to yeah. disobey God, didn't they? Yeah. You think he'll well, choose such? Well, we'd be made perfect at that point. That's so right. I have no problem with that. Because I used to think about that, what the angels did. Yeah. But until you talk, it would be made perfect during that day. We could be in God's presence. You can. And you'll never have to, me and Wayne talked one time about it, and I had the same thought. I thought, you know, I know my nature. When I get an eternity, I'm liable to try and do it. No, you won't. Because God's going to give you eternal life, and the very presence of sin will be taken away. Now, y'all look at God's plan. Does God know what He's doing? Folks, you talk about a God that knows all things. He's not just only cleansing us and bringing us into His presence. He's going to cleanse the very thoughts. I mean, He's going to give us such a treatment in this thing that when we get there, we're going to do nothing but glory in His presence, having experienced in all three facets everything about sin. We have a final promise too that Jesus can never die, so that guarantees that we will never be able to sin again. You can't sin. You're in Christ and you'll never be able to fall again. Hey, Jesus Christ, the only way that you could ever fall or even choose sin again would be Jesus would have to die again. And He ain't going to die again. Now when they get in here, the first thing that happens is they're circumcised. Y'all watch what it says now in verse 10. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. On Pat, the first thing they do, they get circumcised and keep the Passover. Is all this a picture of our entry into the kingdom? It is. Go over, go flip over to Matthew. Matthew 26. Matthew 26. And when I say entry into the kingdom, I mean physically. Spiritually, you're in the kingdom. God would have you live there mentally every day. But we've got to learn that, don't we? Alright, in 26. Verse uh, 26. Now this is the exact same day. I don't know how many years. Roughly 1450 years later. Here we read on the exact same date though. They just did this. And as they were eating, verse 26, Jesus took bread, blessed it, break it, gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom." Do we have a single Passover or that we can go find back there in the, in the wandering? They kept it over here, didn't they? When they come out of Egypt? But when did they keep it again? When they come in. The Lord said at the cross when He delivered us from sin, I'll keep it again when we come into the kingdom. And here we come over here. What's the first thing we find? They do it. Folks, this is a picture. When we're with the Lord, will we need to fast of the things? But think about how they ate in the wilderness. What did they have in between? Manna. And did they like the manna? The manna came down in little small rations, just enough for each day, didn't it? Flip back over to Joshua 5. Joshua 5. Joshua 5.11. Joshua 5 11 it says and they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover unleavened cakes and parched corn in the self same day the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land neither had the children of Israel manna anymore they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year will there be any more rationing the things of God to us Will God need to give us revelation little by little and bit by bit because we're so obstinate and hard-headed? Will there be any more of us longing for the things of God? Will there be any more of us looking at the Scripture and saying, what in the world does that mean? That's what manna means, by the way, is what is this? You ever look at the Scripture and say, I know that this means something, but what? You going to have any of those problems over here? Folks, we're going to eat of the fruit of the land. Y'all think about that. What was the fruit of that land? 
It was grapes so big they couldn't, took two men to carry them. It was honey and it was the most beautiful land in, on earth at the time. Now what is that picture? Christ. It's Christ. It's spiritual fullness. It's Christ. It's the 23rd Psalm. Y'all think about it. He leadeth me beside still waters, doesn't he? He, he leads us into green pastures. He makes us lie down in green pastures. I never knew what that meant until a while back. George showed me something I understood. I just thought I meant resting. You know, a sheep can't eat when it lays down. Won't eat. Will not. So if you're standing in a green pasture and you lay down, you know what that tells me? You must be full. It's like ice cream. I cannot leave ice cream in the freezer. I've got no <laughs> willpower and I'm going to eat it till it's gone. When Lexi sees me quit going to the freezer, she knows something. The ice cream is gone. I've laid down because I am so full. Folks, we're going to be full of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to be with Him forever. We're going to be one with Him. I can't even imagine these things. Paul said, I have not seen nor ear heard the things that the Lord hath prepared for us. He said, but God hath revealed them unto us. How? Little by little, piece by piece, He's showing us, isn't He? He showed those people in His Word what that land was going to be like. And when they got there, they saw it was true. And yet, what did they do in their flesh? They denied it. Me and you would do the same exact thing. And folks, me and you do do the same exact thing on a daily basis. We see the supply of God, and yet we through unbelief deny it. And worse yet than the unbelief, sometimes we through just absolute obstinance refuse it. And you think about that. He, we were up, up I was watching up. Uh, uh, Tim and Brittany have a, she's eight months old. Annabelle, beautiful little girl. She's eight months old, and I love watching babies because you want to see the human nature. You watch a baby. She would, she would sit there, and I, we were uh, sitting at a buffet, and boy, she sat down and she stared at Tim's plate like that, and she started making noise and beating on the table, that, 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 looking at it and all. And her mom's getting her baby food ready, right? She put that baby food up to her, did like that, like that. She'd give it more. Here, come on. Then that like, ooh, it tastes good. Did that. And then did it to her. She was spitting. What was she showing her? She I don't want that. I want that. Right? That was just obstinate. You know what that told me? She wasn't really that hungry, was she? But think about me and you. We say we want to know the things of God. And God shows us the things of Him in the Scripture. You know what I've proved to myself many times? I'm really not that hungry. Because I refuse to walk in the things He says to walk. And I find myself in absolute obstinance to God. And there ain't but one thing that comes from that. It's the same thing that's going to happen to Israel when we see when they ignore the ark and misuse the ark. Guess what? There's no power in the ark. Matter of fact, God's glory departs. People think God's glory only departed one time in the Old Testament. No, Ezekiel showed it. Folks, His glory was coming and going, coming and going. In, in the story over here in Samuel, the priest, Eli the priest, didn't raise his children right. And all it takes is one generation, we know that, to, to turn from God. We, we're seeing it all the time. But he didn't treat his sons right, and his sons were rotten, corrupt priests, weren't they? You know, they went in there into the Holy of Holies and got the ark. They didn't die, did they? Not right then. What does that tell you? God's oh, glory man. wasn't there. They went in there and got the ark and said, we're going to use this thing like now we'll win. We'll, and it was all their own planning. God wasn't in it. God wasn't involved. They marched out there with the ark and the Philistines beat the tar out of them and stole the ark. And the ark's gone for years and years and years until finally David goes and gets it back. And when the Philistines sent the ark, they put it on a cart. They didn't know how to transport the ark. They weren't God's covenant people, were they? They didn't. They, God didn't chastise him not one bit for toting that thing on an ark with oxen. But when David did it, what happened? People died. What's the difference? David belonged to the Lord. The Lord chastises those that are his. David not only did, when we're going to read it, it's fabulous to see what David did, not what he what we can learn from what he did. David wanted to get the ark. His heart was in the right place. The intention was right, but he didn't do it in the right manner. He did not consult the Word of God. He called for a man. Come in and tell him, how are we supposed to transport the ark? And guess what? The man misled him. You know what the man told him instead of the Word of God? The Philistine tradition of carrying it on a cart. Think about religion today. 
How many times do people tell someone some ridiculous tradition when they're confronted with what must I do to be saved? They bring some pagan ritual which entered in through Rome and has come down through the years and David took it just like that. David did it and it cost them their lives, didn't it? But when David realized what he had done, did David get mad and throw a fit and turn out? Nope. David did what he always did. He said, oh, I have fouled it up again. He confessed what he did. He turned to the Lord and then he went to the book and got the instructions and they carried the ark in right, didn't they? And as they're carrying it down the street, they're dancing and playing and celebrating and David's got a wife. And his wife's sitting up in a building and she's staring down there at him with pure hatred. Remember her? I don't, I, McCall or Mikhail, I don't know how to say her name. Y'all know who she is. She's his wife. Do you know what she's called in that passage over and over and over? She's not called the wife of David. She's called the daughter of Saul. Now, who do y'all think she pictures? She's his wife, right? She ain't his wife. Does she love him? It's the false church, folks. It's the tares among the wheat. It's that system. It's that thing in the world which with their mouth professes, oh, we're in covenant, we love the Lord, but in their heart, they hate Him. And there she sat in the window looking at her. And you know what's amazing? David still sustained that woman. Y'all look around at the world today. Is God sustaining the world today? He is. You know why the world has food to eat and water? You say they don't everywhere. Well, that's because they get into places where they and overpopulate and there's other things that happen and consequences but is the sun still rising does rain fall on the just and the unjust does god provide does he provide the atheist that's talking out against him if you, you want to know why god provides go back to genesis chapter 8 god wiped out all the earth except noah didn't he and after the flood god gave his word even to the animals he made a covenant that he wouldn't do that. He would supply them. And he's still doing it today. And you know what the proof is? Every time it rains, look up there. There it is. People say, oh, that's a fairy tale. No, that ain't no fairy tale, folks. That's God's word. If it were a fairy tale, the supply wouldn't have lasted. I mean, y'all think if there's ever been a world that deserved destroying, it's right now. You talk about the days of Noah. Man, we got them. We're living in them. But has God destroyed them yet? Why not? Why didn't he destroy it uh, 120 years before Noah? Because he had Noah and his family there. He's going to get them out, wasn't he? In the ark. Remember we talked last week about there being three arks in Scripture, didn't we? Now let's bring this back to what they are. The first ark was Noah's ark. What is it a picture of? Deliverance from wrath in Christ. Right? Pitched within and without. The next one is... No, a uh, Moses' ark, a little bulrush ark, his mom made him to float him down the river. What was it about? <clears throat> deliverance from Pharaoh's wrath. Deliverance from God's wrath. Deliverance from Pharaoh's wrath. Did God do both? He did in the ark, isn't it? What you got over here? Folks, that's what the ark is. It's God's deliverance from wrath by the saving blood of Christ. Christ became the wrath payment for us. Christ suffered what we owe and He is our atonement. That's what happened at the ark. And we'll, we'll do one more class to get the, the last thing here because we need to look at what they did and how it got back and all. But when you look at the ark, remember what it's a picture of. It's a picture of uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. This is, this is it, the ark. For God made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. We could say, the Son of God became the Son of Man in order that sons of men could become sons of God. It's wood covered in gold in order that we, flesh, could become like Him. He came, He took on our nature in order that we could be partakers of His nature. And this is all pictured in the ark. This is the vessel whereby we're delivered. This is Christ. Okay? Alright, any questions? Alright, thank you all very much.